It's real. It's real. You know the deal. You know the deal. Hey, it's Shantae. And I'm Natalie, and welcome to What's the Deal, a podcast powered by the Norfus Firm. At the Norfus Firm, we solve people problems. We work with employers all around the world on HR and DEI issues. Mm-hmm. Hey, hey, we're here. Hello. <laughs> Happy to be here. This is going to be a great day. It's going to be a great day. And I think because today we're really pushing on some issues that are always out there in the periphery, but we realized, hey, we need to give some some light here. Mm-hmm. Today, we have a guest that I told Shantae before I was going to really work on not being weepy because our guest has had like probably the most impact on my law school career. So um, I'm really, really happy to introduce uh, Professor Alberto Benitez, who is the director of the Immigration Clinic at the George Washington University <laughs> Law School. We had we were, we had a whole like first week of school that you had to put the the in really? front of. Oh yeah, it was like a is really that a big thing deal. Now in higher ed? Well, I don't know. It's a, it was a thing okay. there. Okay. Yeah, you said now, girl. This was decades sure. ago. So sure. yeah, you had been <laughs> practicing in law for a very long time. Yeah, I forgot. How so, you work? <laughs> <laughs> we Sorry. take it to a place that it doesn't need to go, but here we are. So the, the thing that is near and dear to my heart about Professor Benitez is really many things, but I chose to go to GW for the immigration clinic and the immigration, because right before I started law school, a very, very dear friend of mine was removed, uh, also known as deported. And in my mind, if I got into GW and got into this immigration clinic, I could somehow get her back, which was, I quickly learned very naive, Mm. Um, but I did get into GW. I got into Professor Benitez's Immigration One class, which was really, really hard. (laughs) And it really opened my eyes to the fact that we are given such bullshit views on how easy it is to come into this country. Like if you watch the news, you make, it makes it seem like you just have to like get on a plane and come and that's it. But what became really clear and going through all these visa categories is that, oh, it is really not that easy to get into this country and to stay lawfully. And so um, Professor Benitez is a tough love kind of professor Mm -hmm. and his clinic is, was at the time, I don't know if it is now, but a lottery So you could apply for the clinic, but it didn't mean you were going to get in. And so the day that the results came out, I walked over to the clinic and it was, they were up on the door and my name was not on the list. And I could remember the tears like welling up in the back of my eyes because I didn't get it. And I knew that my friends that applied were not nearly as interested as me. (laughs) So like the whole summer I emailed him like, like at least like every two weeks, did anyone drop out? Can I please, like, can you please make space for me? And I, and and I think this is the first thing that I learned in terms of at least dealing with uh, Professor Benitez is the importance of importance of persistence, Mm -hmm. right? Like stick to it. So either I got on his nerves badly enough or someone dropped out, but I got in either way. Yeah. Hey, a win is a win. A win is a win. Either way, a win is a win. So the persistence piece was number one. I think number two, um, a really huge thing, uh, I think, and I don't know, again, Professor Benitez can clarify this. At the time, GW was the only law school in the country that allowed students to represent um, clients pro bono. And he really ran the clinic and I'm sure still does is like a law firm. So he let us go out and really figure out whether people had cases and represent them. Um, and so I was assessing a client for asylum and they brought in all their paperwork and professor Benitez regularly told us, do not take originals out of the clinic. Like if you're going to work on this at home, make a copy. For whatever reason, I took someone's original documents out of the clinic, momentary insanity, and they were his only forms of identification. Wow. So I went out and my car got broken into. My book bag, which was like a free laptop bag from like Westlaw or Lexus, so it looked like it had a laptop in it, but it had nothing but papers in it. His papers? His papers were were stolen. And at the time, Professor Benitez refused to get a cell phone. So you, he okay. would tell us that you could call him at like seven in the morning. Like you could call him as early as seven, but at his house. So I sat on my bed until like 7 a.m. Knowing I was going to get kicked out of law school. Like, just forget it. I'm, I'm done. My life is over. And I tell him what happens. 
And he's like, you know what the worst part is? I was like, I'm going to get kicked out. <laughs> he's like, you have to tell the client. And I was like, oh, okay, I can do that. <laughs> and then he also mentioned, you know, that a lot of people would have lied about it and applauded the truth. And again, the humility piece is important. I don't understand how I would lie about that because eventually it would have come back to me, but I get, I get that point. And then the last really important thing that I got from, from uh, Professor, Professor Benitez's tutelage is you can change your mind. Mm-hmm. So when I started my career, I really thought I would go into immigration. That wasn't a possibility. I was feeling like I was selling out. He told me I wasn't. And then he ended up um, in Cleveland and, while I was in Cleveland and I had dinner with him and I'm like, I don't know. I don't know if this is really what I want to do, but I haven't been there that long. And he was like, it doesn't matter. Right. Like if you want to do something different, you can do something different. And I remember that conversation really helped me propel into I'm going to do something different. Mm -hmm. So thank you, Professor Benitez. We are so happy to have you. (laughs) Thank you both. I'm honored. And thank you for the trip down memory lane. Um, I had forgotten a lot of it, but it all rings true, like the kinds of things I say and do. But um, it's it's an honor for me to be here with both of you ladies and spend some time together. Yes. So what we really want to touch on is thinking about the immigrant experience in the workplace. Uh, There are a lot of challenges like that folks who were not born in the U.S., don't speak English as their native language, uh, face coming in. Um, There is a quote I'm going to read a little bit of to you and I'd love for you to react to it and just some of what you see and what some of the things that employers should be thoughtful of. So for those who watch Modern Family, Sofia Vergara plays Gloria. And there is a GIF, and we'll put it up for those who watch on YouTube. And she says, do you know how frustrating it is to have to translate everything in my head before I say it? Do you even know how smart I am in Spanish? Mm -hmm. And um, a CEO at a company called Swap Language used those GIFs. His name is Nicholas uh, Wallstead to say, this is precisely how it feels to work abroad. Whether speaking in a foreign language with colleagues or friends, expressing yourself and showing them who you really are is extremely challenging. It feels like losing a piece of yourself. If you meet an international who uses basic phrases in your native language, remember that is not who they are. Um, If someone struggles to speak your language, it's not because they are less competent. It's a language barrier. So what's your reaction to that and just thinking about that in the context of being an employee here? Spot on. I think that there's a lack of sensitivity, empathy among a lot of employers, not all, but a lot of employers to the struggles of just basic level communication, ordering a sandwich, asking for the right metro station, the right bus. Um, The kind of work I do, as you know, Natalie, is what we call humanitarian asylum. I don't do employment-based immigration, so I don't represent big corporations. I represent the lady who just barely got out of Afghanistan because she's a lawyer and a a women's rights activist. And in Afghanistan, that's lethal. Or the gay man from Iran, that's lethal. These are smart, both of them are lawyers, by the way, as I mentioned, the, the, the lady from Afghanistan is a lawyer, the, the gentleman from Iran is a, law, is a lawyer in Iran getting an advanced degree in the US. So they're educated, smart, sophisticated people in their country, but here they're starting at the bottom, essentially. They can't really practice until they pass a bar in the United States. The concepts are different the legal concepts are different. And that's someone who has some fluency in English. When we start talking about people like many of them who are at the border, this purported surge that wasn't a surge after all, these are people who are walking through jungles, walking through deserts, dealing with gangs, dealing with cartels, riding trains, riding buses, and they don't speak a word of English, and they're supposed to explain their story to a U.S. government official out in the middle of nowhere. The lawyer from Afghanistan and and Iran, they took a lot of time to explain their story to us in our office 
very calm, with some coffee, with some water. How someone from Central America, say, or from Africa, is supposed to explain their story in the middle of the desert, in the middle of the night, is beyond me. So there's a lack of understanding of basic communication issues. It sounds also like not even thinking about just their starting point, like what it takes for them to even. Oh, no, that does not happen. Because <laughs> all people do is they're dealing with whatever's showing up in front of them right now. So they, there's no thought as to how did this person even get here? Like for me to be even even having this interaction with them, there's no consideration of that whatsoever, which I'm really happy you brought up the empathy piece because that's a really big part of how we relate to one another. So can you go a little further there, Professor Benitez, in terms of how should empathy be applied? Like what are the considerations? Because I, I believe that should it can be a general application regardless of if it's in the workplace, if it's just in life, like empathy is huge. So how would that, how should people think through that in terms of when they're dealing with folks who aren't native to the country that they're from? One of the things I remember, Ashante, is um, from, from my grade school and high school education. I went to Catholic schools. I didn't remember a whole lot from grade school and high school, but I do remember that I learned from the nuns and from the friars about being open-minded and recognizing that not everybody is the same, even if people have traits and characteristics and customs that are not mine and that I don't identify with or necessarily even adopt. And being, as I mentioned, I'm proud to say that I'm 62, there's a lot of things about my students, music and food and things that I don't understand. Like TikTok, I'm still struggling with TikTok and Becky G and Bad Bunny and These are all people in entertainment that I've made a point of listening to, but they're not going to displace for me the Beatles in my, in my, in my sympathy, but I can understand that there's a big world out there. I think that's what's missing among a lot of employers. These hardworking immigrants are not like me, but I'm not going to even bother to try to understand or to try to understand. And even if I can never understand, I'm at least going to be supportive and respectful of their language, of their culture, of their foods, Um, maybe learn some basic Spanish, maybe give them some basic training in, in English, try to understand. And I think this difference, this lack of ability to understand difference to me, is all about empathy and understanding that the world is not just like me. And I wish there was more of that at all levels in our society and certainly in dealing with, with people who are not from the United States. I, I think that it's interesting because I talk a lot when I do um, harassment and discrimination training. I talk about some of these little small things that are actually really big things that can cause people to feel excluded. Food is a big one. And um, when my son was in the fourth grade, he was telling he had a classmate who was from India and uh, a lot of the other classmates sort of turned their nose up at, at when he brought curry. And so I got permission from the teacher to come in and do like an unconscious bias training, but tailored to fourth and fifth graders. And. I brought up sort of the example of not speaking ill of other people's food, even if it's not normal to you, it's normal to them. And it's like your, your view of normal is not the only view. view Right. And he talked a lot about how important curry was to his culture, not just the flavor, but just how important it was. And it was really cool because again, even these young children can have these conversations and be able to see stuff from a different perspective, but what's your perspective on your normal isn't the only normal? Well, I do think a lot of it has to do with the fact that people have to be willing, in this case, for example, I'll speak about myself. I have to be willing to accept that the world when I was a high school or a college or a law student is is a world that's different now. Uh, Technologically, cell phones, foods, I grew up in Buffalo, New York, which is not a very diverse place, but I grew up in a 
small Mexican community in a city that's wonderful, but it just really wasn't as diverse as I would have liked it back in 1976. Um, but I, then I, I left and I saw other parts of the world, met different people, and I learned, you know, I'm proud of who I am and how I grew up, but there's a lot of stuff out there and people out there and foods out there. The sad part is, as we know, there's lots of people who refuse to, to learn about other things and other people and view it sort of as an attack. And we know about this whole ridiculous replacement theory. They're here to replace us. They're here to take us. No, I can tell you from the clients that I work with, they're not interested in replacing anyone. They're interested in helping themselves. They're interested in helping their families. They're interested in making this country better. But some people just take it as a threat. And when people are threatened, when people are afraid, especially what they don't understand, they can react in very, very ugly ways. So I, I love your, your idea and your action of going to school and using food as, as, as a tool to open broad. You, you may not like curry. You may not like curry, and that's fine. But try it. Try it at least. And then you can make an informed decision. It's delicious for those of you who have not tried curry. It's amazing, by the way. It is. I mean, curry is wonderful. It's not my favorite food. It'll never displace Mexican food, but I love curry. I love curry. And someone wants to take me to curry, I'll go eat curry. But I never ate curry when I was living in Buffalo. It just wasn't, it wasn't a thing. Um, I have a question that I'd, I'd want us to really kind of look at and, and unpack around this resistance to other Right. Get, especially if we're trying to support and champion cultures of an, of inclusion and cl inclusivity. And you're maybe supporting that in your workplace or an environment, wherever you are. And you see you you see the resistance that some of your colleagues face from others. And you're someone who's trying to support that. Like what what are some of the interventions? What are some of the things that you can do as someone who supports inclusivity, who wants to support folks who aren't native to the country and, and, and see the resistance that they're facing from maybe colleagues about wanting to really understand their experience? Sure. Well, one of the things that I think is very important, and I push this continuously, is that I think, for lack of a better description, uh, persons of color, diverse communities, however you want to describe it, we need to be in positions where we can make decisions about policies, about procedures. I think too long we've been in positions where we are advocating for changes, and it's a very different to be sitting at the table and say, no, I think we should do this, and I think we should do that. And you know what? We're actually going to do it. So for example, the example that Natalie gave about admitting her into the immigration clinic, that was a decision that I made. Um, I made a conscious decision to admit Natalie. Um, if I wasn't in the position to be making that decision, perhaps another director of the clinic wouldn't have admitted Natalie. As a director of the immigration clinic, I'm the one that sets policy, what kinds of cases we're going to take, which kinds of cases we're not going to take. We recently wrote a comment to a federal regulation that we opposed, and we wrote the comment and we submitted it to the federal government. Um, if, if I was a different person, perhaps, I wouldn't have written that comment or asked my students to write that comment. We need to become deans of law schools, we need to become CEOs of companies, we need to become, um, uh, CFOs, we need to become presidents of the United States, we need to become chief justices of the Supreme Court. And one of my frustrations is that inevitably when I stand up in front of my students and say, okay, who here is going to become a Supreme Court justice? No one raises their hand. They say, well, why not? Why can't you all become Supreme Court justices? Why can't you become presidents and senators? And if you're unhappy with the immigration laws as they're written, well, become a senator, become a member of Congress, and you write the laws, and you become a president, and you sign the law. We have to teach ourselves and the people that are following us to dream and think big. And Barack Obama dreamt big. He dreamt really big. He could have stayed on the south side of Chicago doing great work, and he was doing great work, but he he was dreaming big. So. I guess that's what I what I I would like to see more of us making decisions. It makes a really big difference. 
actually. Mm -hmm. Um, We've seen this in in our own work with uh, we do we we recruit for our clients and we are willing to look deeper than someone's resume. And uh, it's fascinating how often our clients will just disregard a candidate just by looking at the resume because they only spent one year here, then one year there, then that piece, or they had a gap in time, all these things. But we really are like, there's something else here. And so at least we'll have a screening call. And I can't tell you how many times we've had to push a client, like just forget what you think, forget your resume biases, right? Because um, this person could have a lot more to offer than your, but that's also because we come from marginalized groups. We've been passed over. We've been ignored. We've worked really, really hard and not seen progress. And so being in that sort of position of influence to be the first person looking at their resumes and saying, I'm not going to look for something that's because anybody can write a good resume. And that's the thing I think people forget. And a resume is like a snapshot of who a person is. And so, but being in that position, we've helped clients see and hire candidates that they would have totally passed over. So I love that idea of diversify who gets to make decisions, which we talk about a lot. What do you think about that? Yeah, we do a lot in equity and decision making um, with our clients. And so it is it's having the voices, the perspectives, the backgrounds, the experiences. You need that in the room and, and in a position of authority in order to make a decision that can support someone in the workplace. Otherwise, you kind of are on the sidelines and you really can't have as much of an influence or impact as you'd like to have if you're not in that seat. So I appreciate that framing. Wow. OK, so we could talk, like, this is like, whew. and I bet if we got I bet if we got our guys in the room involved, we'd be here for a long time. (laughs) Um, but to just recap this, this first episode, it's your normal is not the only normal and trying something different, whether it be food or perspective or the like Mm -hmm. is not an attack on your identity. In fact, it can probably improve or at least improve who you are as a person. And lastly, we need representation that isn't just having bodies of color in your building but having people of color, people from marginalized groups in positions of influence, Mm -hmm. whether it's the ability to hire people, make certain product decisions or service decisions or whatever the case may be is change, change. That's how we change these systems, right? That we talk about a lot. Don't forget the empathy. Oh, right. I mean, how could I, you'd never let us forget (laughs) (laughs) and empathy. Yes. So we have one more episode with Professor Benitez. Really excited about that. We're happy to have you here and stay tuned for the next episode.